for coming out tonight. I am Chris Costa, the Executive Director of the International Spy Museum, and I'm excited to introduce this program, Dawn of the Cold War, looking back at the Berlin blockade and airlift 70 years after the last American flight. We'll commemorate the Berlin airlift this evening. But first, I also want to recognize our co-sponsors for this event, Deutschland Jahr, did I say that right? My German okay? and the Allied Museum in Berlin, where our Vice President, our very own Exhibitions and Programs Vice President, Anna Slafer, is on the advisory board. Anna. I'd like to thank you all for your support and coordination in organizing this event this evening. At the moment, I would like to introduce Dr. Jürgen Lille Teicher, the Director of the Allied Museum in Berlin. He is in charge currently of managing the reinvention process for the Allied Museum, which will move from its current location in southwest Berlin into a hangar at the former airport building in Berlin Tempelhof, a huge complex built in the Nazi era. His academic career also brought him to Washington, D.C. He was a research fellow at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, working on his Ph.D. project on the restitution of Jewish property in post-war Germany. His latest publication in 2016 dealt with the memorialization of democracy, the history of democracy in museums, in memorial sites across Germany. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jürgen Lill. Teicher, please. It's a tough one. Yeah, hello. Hello, you all. Can I move this up? Yeah, I think I have to move it up a bit. It's nice to be back in DC, actually. Um, thanks that you all came. Thanks, uh, Chris, that for this nice introduction, and um, thanks to your team to host us here um, in this magnificent building, I have to say. Um, being charged uh, reinventing a museum, I really understand what you have achieved here, so congratulations. And it's a deep honor that we have Anna Slafer on our advisory board, so she will be with us once we create our new museum. I'm very grateful that Ralph J. Dion is with us. He is a real airlift veteran. Um, it's amazing to have you here tonight. Thanks for coming, and it's a, a cordial welcome from us all. Um, I will introduce you shortly. Um, our event today is part of the um, campaign of the Auswärtige Amt, or Foreign ha Office of Germany, under the title Wunderbar Together. The Allied Museum in Berlin has also designed a traveling exhibition on the Berlin LF, which traveled through Seattle, Chicago, Houston, Kansas City, and Atlanta. Thanks to the Foreign Ministry for its support for the event today and the traveling exhibition and the reception afterwards. Also thanks to the Goethe Institute, which was our closest partner in making this happen. To put it briefly, the Berlin LF is a central part of our um, exhibition, our permanent exhibition in Berlin. Uh, we have a huge airplane in front, the, um, uh, which shows, uh, British shows the originality of that event. Um, the museum has an expertise on it about 25 years, I would say. And what is the Allied Museum, actually? Some people say, what is the Allied Museum? Uh, this is a name which really has to be explained 25 years after the withdrawal of the troops uh, um, of the Allied forces from Berlin. Um, our museum was founded sort of two years after the withdrawal as a gesture of gratitude of the German people towards the um, Allied troops to Great Britain, France, and the US. Um, the, these three countries are members of our museum, so we are a real international museum, and um, they sort of steer our fate, let's say, in a way. So despite whatever happens in international relations, in our museum, people come together. So. Um, we still live as today the transatlantic relations, the friendship to the yes. So um, I think history has this potential to tell a positive story and say, well, that's what we have. That you can never can steal it from us. Um, so our museum is more in charge to show the merits of the Western Allies for Berlin and Germany as a whole. Um, the first exhibition was already in 1994. Um, today, 
our permanent exhibition um, focuses on the process of how enemies became friends. And um, you would think, what about the Russians? They also were allies. There's another museum, in, well, in East Berlin, uh, right in the beginning, and um, the museum in Berlin, Karls Horst, um, um, became a sort of museum in charge, well, first showing the German war in the Soviet Union, but that's the place where uh, the Soviets have their spot, let's say. So our memorial culture is sort of a, really a process of, or a result of the Cold War. So we see, we'll see how it comes together one day. Um, our museum is facing several challenges, uh, Chris Costa was saying, and, and to face these challenges, to become relevant, really have to change places, and we really want to show our big objects in that huge uh, um, airport, well, one of the hangars. So, but still, um, it's, it's a big project, and uh, you really have to see, um, is this kind of story we're telling tonight really central to the German memorial culture. It's, it's, um, it's part of the memorial culture in Berlin, but um, as you might know, in Germany we focus on the Nazi past, on the past of the GDR, uh, of the SED dictatorship, but to tell this positive stories like the airlift, it has to find its way into the memorial culture, which we really would like to do with the new museum. So, um, so that's what I want to say. Um, let me introduce you to the guests tonight. Or um, first is Professor Hope Harrison. She is an associate professor of history and international affairs at the George Washington Muse uh, University here in Washington, D.C. She is the author of a new book, After the Berlin Wall, Memory and the Making of the New Germany 1989 to the Present, which has just been published this week. So congratulations. Um, her previous work includes the prize-winning book Driving Soviets Up the Wall, which was also published to wide acclaim in German translation. Dr. Harrison is a member of our advisory board at the Allen Museum, so we owe her already a lot, so you, she will be with us re reinventing the museum. She has appeared on CNN, the History Channel, the Science Channel, the BBC, and Deutschland Radio, so thanks. Um, Hope, that's nice that you're with us tonight, that you came over. Um, Bernd Koska, um, he is a scholarly employee of our museum and curator at the Allied Museum and the or our expert on the Berlin Airlift. He has published several articles on this topic and participated in countless discussions. He gave several lectures on the Airlift. Uh, the last was in Bologna, Italy. Um, in 2010, he edited it's one example of his publications, an anthology on the Berlin Airlift, Die Berliner Luftbrücke, Ereignis und Erinnerung, the Berlin Airlift event and memory. Um, he's one of the founding curators of our museum and created several exhibitions. Bernd was in charge of creating the travel exhibition, traveling exhibition I just mentioned for the Deutschlandjahr, and managed also his journey. I can tell you that's a really hard job. You never know, you know, something gets broken, so you have to manage that from Germany. Through his long-lasting experience, he knows several veterans. So he got in contact with Ralph, and he just said, yes, I'm coming. So we were really <laughs> happy, you know. Um, so Ralph, again, it was a special honor to have you here. You're already in your 90s, if I may say that. Um, some hints on, on Ralph. Ralph joined the US Army Air Force soon after he graduated from high school um, in North Nashua, uh, New Hampshire, in June 1946. He became a C. 54 mechanic and was transferred to the 520s Air Transport Group at Westover DFB in Chicopi Falls. Is that correct? Yeah, Chicopi Falls um, to work as a transport, um, transport aircrafts. On the 26th of July 1948, he was selected for a 90 days TDY to Rhein Main Airbase near Frankfurt, Germany, in order to support the Berlin airlift effort. He performed 12-hour shifts outside maintenance work, a very hard job, what I can read. Near end of October 1948, he was assigned to flying status at a C-54 flight engineer, sitting in, in the actual plane and caring for its functionality in between the pilot and the co-pilot. So if you ever been in such an historic aeroplane, it's not like a plane today, so it's, it's really a challenge. This brought him to fly between Frankfurt and Tempelhof Airport on a regular basis. He was at age 21 during these days. Today he is active in the Berlin Airlines Veterans Association and he's going to meet his friends in Wichita, so soon, tomorrow. 
So that's the information, Ralph. The floor is now yours, Hope. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I am honored to be here, particularly with Mr. Ralph Dion, and um, very happy always to be with my colleagues from the Allied Museum in Berlin, Jürgen and Berndt, and Anna as well. Um, so, uh, let's see if I um, can figure, yes, okay. Um, so I'm going to set the historical background for you to understand what we're talking about tonight before we have the high point of the evening uh, with Mr. Dion. Um, what was this Berlin airlift um, from 1948 to 49? What was going on in Berlin at the time? Why was Berlin, in fact, really the center of the world, the center of the Cold War? Uh, well, at the end of World War II, the four allies, the US, Soviet Union, Great Britain, and France, decided that their treatment of Germany after World War I hadn't worked so well. Germany rose up again and started World War II. So this time they decided they needed boots on the ground in Germany, which they hadn't done after World War I. So they established four occupation zones in Germany. These were not meant to be permanent. Germany was not meant to be divided. This was just to um, keep Germany defeated and sort of figure out what would come next. Not only was the country as a whole divided into four occupation zones, but the capital, Berlin, was also divided into four sectors. Um, the country was run by the Allied Control Council with four military governors from each of the four powers. Um, but there was a deep contradiction um, embedded in the original plans, which said that Germany must be treated as a whole. Everybody had to treat their zone of Germany the same. But on the other hand, each zonal commander could make his own decisions. Uh, so you, you know what happened there. The Cold War began. Um, they had very different views about what sort of political system, what sort of economic system, what sort of educational system, what sort of newspapers, cultural events should happen in their parts of Germany and Berlin. Um, and uh, they often could not agree. So Berlin was also run by these four uh, military commanders. Um, <clears throat> now the key thing to understand to all of this is the geography of Berlin. Berlin, the city, was 110 miles deep inside of the Soviet occupation zone. Hence, for the US, Britain, and France to get from their zones of Germany to their sectors of Berlin, they had to get across 110 miles of the Soviet occupation zone. And that's where our dramatic story uh, really begins. Uh, Germany after World War II and the capital city was in ruins, um, particularly the cities which had been bombed by the Allies. Um, of course, Germany had um, uh, invaded and occupied many countries. No country suffered more than the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin. Uh, which lost 27 mi million people in World War II, fighting the brunt of the war for the first three years on their own. Uh, so you can imagine how Stalin felt about Germany at the end of World War II. His policy was very much one of revenge um, and to definitely keep Germany weak. Uh, he also sought to take as much as he could in terms of reparations out of his zones of Germany 
uh, and Berlin. President Harry Truman uh, increasingly was worried about Soviet communist power in Germany and in Eastern Europe, uh, worried about the economic situation in Germany and Europe, uh, and increasingly feeling that um, we needed to be concerned with the Soviets more than the Germans. Winston Churchill felt the same way coming to the U.S. in 1946, giving his famous speech in Fulton, Missouri, where he coined the term Iron Curtain, saying there's an Iron Curtain descending in Europe with communism and lack of freedom on one side and uh, democracy and freedom on the other side. Uh, Britain played a very important role. Uh, the British zone of Germany was primarily industrial, and Britain was suffering after World War II. So in addition to trying to pick themselves up again and get their own economy going, they also had to be feeding the Germans in their zone of Germany because there wasn't much agricultural land. And pretty quickly, Prime Minister Attlee and Foreign Minister Bevin felt that really they needed to let the Germans in their zone start creating their industries again so that they could produce goods for export and make money to get the food to feed themselves instead of British taxpayers doing that. As the Cold War developed, um, Secretary of State Marshall uh, visited Joseph Stalin in the spring of 1947 in Moscow, in the Kremlin, to talk about Germany and the state of Europe. Marshall left those meetings with Stalin very worried that Stalin said he wasn't worried about the dire situation in Europe, they should be patient. Marshall thought he was just waiting for things to get so bad in Europe that um, they would all vote for communists. And Marshall didn't want that to happen. Uh, and so he came back to the US and talked to President Truman about helping Germany and Europe recover from World War II with, Marsh with massive Marshall Plan aid, ultimately $12 billion given to 16 countries to help them recover. So now we come to what would begin uh, the crisis in Berlin. In order for the German zones um, to be able to recover um, and profit from Marshall Plan aid, they needed to get rid of the old Reichsmark, the old currency, and institute the new Deutsche Mark so that the currency would actually be worth something and the, co uh, the economy could be stabilized. Um, the Soviets said, this is not allowed. You can't introduce your own currency. We're supposed to all be treating our Germany the same. We said, well, you haven't been treating your zone the same. You're sponsoring the Communist Party. You're taking things out of your zones. You're not following the rules either. Um, and uh, Stalin was also cognizant that the West had become so suspicious of what he was up to that the West was beginning to plan for the creation of a separate West German state. And to stop that, Stalin decided to blockade the land and water routes to Berlin. It was the Brits with Bevin and uh, General Lucius D. Clay in the United States who decided to respond to Stalin's blockade of Berlin with an airlift. Um, the, no one thought this was going to work. Um, to be able to supply the two and a half million West Berliners who were surrounded by the Soviet communist zone, to supply two and a half million Berliners from the air with food, with coal in the winter, with um, books for schools, with clothes, with furniture, everything you can imagine. 
Uh, no one thought this would work, but um, increasingly it showed that it was going to work. Um, the Berliners under Mayor Ernst Reuter um, came together um, in a mass demonstration in front of the Reichstag on September 9th, 1948. 300,000 people came. Um, and uh, Mayor Reuter announced, we cannot be bartered. We cannot be negotiated, we Berliners. We cannot be sold out to the Soviets. Whoever would surrender this city, whoever would surrender the people of Berlin, would surrender himself. That showed how um, the morale of the West Berliners was to fight this blockade. Uh, the U.S. called the airlift Operation Vittles. The Brits called it Operation Plainfair. The Germans called it the Luftbrücke, the air bridge. Um, again, to remind you, deep inside the Soviet zone, these planes were flying in three air corridors from West Germany into, from the western zones of Germany um, to the western sectors of Berlin. Um, here are some amazing numbers to tell you what went on. At the beginning of the airlift, they were delivering 5,000 tons a day. By the end of the airlift, a year later, it was 8,000 tons a day. On Easter Sunday in 1949, there were 13,000 tons of supplies brought to Berlin. A total of over 278,000 airdrops. And U.S. crews with people like Ralph Dion um, flew over 189,000 flights to help the West Berliners. At the height of the airlift, one plane landed every 45 seconds at Tempelhof Airport. Here you see um, the three airports in the western sectors. Tempelhof was in the American sector, the main, um, uh, the main um, airport where um, our Allied Museum is hoping to, to move. Um, you see Gatow to the left in the British sector. During the airlift, a third airport was built, the airport that is now still used as the main airport in the western part of Berlin. Tegel Airport was built during this airlift. Um, one of the most um, beloved parts of the airlift for children is that um, some people, in particular the pilot Gail Halverson, um, became known as the candy bomber because he dropped candy, little parachutes of candy, down to kids who would write to him and give him their address and say, you know, please, next time, can you come over my street? I didn't get any candy last time. Um, Chancellor Angela Merkel honored Halverson uh, in 2008 on the 60th anniversary of the airlift. And I know that Ralph Dion is going to see him tomorrow in Kansas at their reunion for the airlift. Um, here outside of Tempelhof Airport is the monument to the airlift showing the three uh, air corridors. Um, Stalin finally realized he had failed um, in what he wanted, and on May 12th, after almost a year, he stopped the blockade. The Allies continued the airlift actually up until September 30th, um, so the anniversary will be next week um, because they wanted to really have stockpiles of goods in West Berlin in case the Soviets did it again. But um, it was a massive failure. It was, in fact, one of the biggest fa foreign policy failures Stalin ever made because he got the exact opposite of what he set out to do. 
while the airlift was still going on, NATO was founded, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization founded right here in Washington, D.C., um, and a separate state of West Germany, a democratic capitalist state, was founded in May of 1949. Um, so. Two of the things Stalin most wanted to forestall, a separate West German state and some sort of Western military alliance. Instead, he provoked by this blockade, which so brilliantly was countered by the American and the British airlift. And I will close with this final slide that the Berliners ever since then have felt a very strong solidarity to the United States. And after September 11, 2001, when we suffered the terrorist attacks, tens of thousands of Berliners went out on the streets in solidarity with the U.S., mourning for our loss and saying that they would stand with us the way we stood with them during the Berlin blockade and airlift. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad we can be guests of the new International Spy Museum, this new fascinating location here in Washington today. Um, some of you might ask themselves, why is the topic of the Berlin Airlift presented in a spy museum? Well, first of all, Professor Hope Harrison explained that this was the beginning of the Cold War, and that was the hot phase of the espionage, and second, I would like to emphasize that there is a connection between the history of the Berlin airlift and the espionage and reconnaissance. I will just explain this connection now for a minute before I start my lecture. During the year 1945, uh, the four powers produced a huge amount of agreements. One of them was the result of a Soviet wish for an air agreement because they want to prevent uncontrolled air traffic over their Soviet zone. So in November, they were talking about a treaty concerning the creation of a system of air corridors to be used for flights in the respective zones of occupation in Germany. Finally, in 1946, this 14-page agreement was signed. An agreement established the installation of three air corridors from the western zones to and from Berlin. All three corridors were limited in length, width, and height. So they were physical corridors. Here you see a flight line at uh, Tegel, and here you see uh, the corridors. Uh, one is from the north, from the big airfields um, in the American zone, uh, Frankfurt and Wiesbaden, and the other two corridors uh, lead into the British zone. And this is uh, the way uh, the American and British were entering the city by air. The Americans started to operate planes with good long-range cameras on those corridor flights. So this reconnaissance operation continued during the Berlin airlift, and it did not only continue, but it was getting bigger. First of all, the threat of a war in 1948 was bigger than in 1946, and they wanted to know what is going on in the Soviet zone. And second, it was much easier to fill in those reconnaissance planes in the flight routine of the airlift. In a daily bunch of approximately 500 planes inside the corridor to Berlin, you would not notice there is one single plane just taking photos and not even landing in Berlin. And after the blockade, the three corridors obviously remained, and also those reconnaissance flights in those three corridors to Berlin over the GDR territory continued weekly for more than 40 years until Germany's unification in 1990. So as you can see, there is a connection between the Berlin Airlift and our location here this evening. Now back to uh, my main subject, Berlin Airlift, and uh, the 15 to 20 minutes is just enough to tell you about the basics. Some of the subjects uh, Hope Harrison uh, was touching on already. Restart the life in Berlin and the currency reform. The four occupation powers, Great Britain, United States, France, and the Soviet Union were restarting the daily life in Berlin from 1945 onwards. 
especially in the first couple of months, they did that very successfully together. But starting in 1946, and more obvious in 1947, the ideas how to deal with Germany drifted apart, as Hoppersen explained. Besides many minor problems, uh, the currency reform was a big problem. Uh, the victorious powers had been forced to tackle the currency situation in Germany since the end of the war in 1945, a drastic huge amount of money, a lack of acceptance for the currency, and a flourishing black market made reform a matter of urgency. But finally, they could not agree on a four-power combined agreement reform in the summer of 1948. And as a result of the currency reform in the western zone of Germany, the Soviet Union started the blockade of Berlin because they didn't want the new currency in Berlin. Between June 19 and June 29, 1948, the Soviet blocked all routes by land, by rail and waterways between West Berlin and the three western zones. On the 24th of June, all land traffic and electric supply was cut off. Here you see a photo, uh, the lorries uh, queuing at the border, um, doesn't mind what the load is, could be fresh food, whatever. Uh, so um, they were just standing there, couldn't get any further, and that was um, the blocking of all land traffic. And only the air corridors on which the four powers agreed in 1945-46, uh, that I already mentioned, were unaffected by this blockade. Because um, interception of an Allied airplane in the corridor would be a casus belli, would be a reason for a war. Because uh, the air corridors, believe it or not, was the only agreement that the Soviets ever signed how the Allies should get to their uh, sectors in Berlin. So no agreement on the land, no agreement on the rail, and the air agreement was the only thing they ever signed, and they didn't want to breach that uh, assignment, so um, the air corridors were not affected by the blockade. The Western powers were still in a position to provide food and goods to their own military personnel in the blockaded city, but w that would not solve the much bigger problem how should they feed more than two million West Berliners? To solve the problem, the three Western powers began an airlift to Berlin to supply the city and its inhabitants. It was an ambitious plan, never before attempted on such a scale, and it was unclear whether it would work. Of course, there had been other plans. General Lucius de Clay, who was the military governor of Germany, had the idea to break the blockade with an armored convoy. This idea was rejected in Washington because of the high risk of an armed confrontation with the Soviets that could easily lead into a new war. So when the British had the idea that a combined Anglo-American air fleet would be able to supply uh, most of the people in West Berlin, uh, and that was the only option they could try. And now the airlift starts. On June 28th, the first American and British aircraft landed at Tempelhof and Gatto airfield with goods for the people of Berlin. Many other things, many other flights followed, uh, but nobody could predict how long the blockade would last. For that reason, the Western powers initially planned to supply the city into the winter. The aim in the first weeks um, was to fly in roughly four and a half thousand tons of goods into the city every day, and that raised to 5,000 tons, and as you've just seen, uh, it was uh, climbing up more and more. Um, in this picture uh, that is uh, from Gatto, you can see German workers uh, unloading uh, sacks from a C-54. But most people think um, that food was the most important freight, but that's not true. People need food to survive, but a city needs energy to survive. So uh, more than 60% of the overall tonnage of the Berlin airlift was coal. 
The Berliner himself was able to receive 12 kilograms of coal on his ration card, but not for each month. 12 kilograms of coal for the whole winter 48-49. The rest of the coal was used to create energy for the Berlin industries, so they could survive and produce goods for at least two to three hours a day. In late summer 1948, US General William H. Tanner was appointed to head the Combined Elef Task Force, the Anglo-American Air Fleet, which had its headquarters in Wiesbaden. Uh, he was the logistic genius behind the operation and he perfected the airlift. The American military governor of Germany, Lucius D. Clay, ensured the, necessi uh, the necessary political support of the US President Harry S. Truman. Clay continually requested more and larger aircraft to use in the Berlin airlift and Truman approved them. The British Royal Air Force not only involved most of their military transport aircraft, but the British government also hired and paid for planes from 23 private charter companies to fly goods to blockaded West Berlin, the capital of the Third Reich, the former enemy that sent V2 rockets to Great Britain just four years before, was now supplied by former Western enemies. The part of the French Oppenheim forces was basically the construction of the urgently needed third airport in Tegel in the French sector. It was completed in November 1948. Some 19,000 workers built it in a record time, just taking three months. With their C-54 transport plane, the US Air Force provided the largest air fleet for the Operation Vittles, as the American called the mission. More than 400 C-54 planes were involved in this operation. The amount of cargo flown into Berlin, uh, as well as out of Berlin, was increasing every month. Only November 1948 was a bit difficult because of the heavy fog. Uh, the winter 1948-49 was not as hard and cold as the Soviet might have hoped. And here you can see uh, one of General Turner's idea. So this is, uh, I mentioned the air corridor and it is a physical corridor and it was Turner's idea that he split this corridor in five levels. Each level just 500 feet from the next level. So a plane right in the middle uh, on a day like today uh, could easily spot the plane in front of him or above him so they were fly flying so tight. And the next idea Tanner had is that a pilot who was not able to land on the first attempt in Templehof or whether Gata or Tegel um, could not say, oh, come on, folks, let me in there somewhere in between. And uh, he has to fly back uh, with this plane and the uh, full load back to his uh, base in Frankfurt, Wiesbaden or wherever. And as a pilot, you do that once or you do that twice. And then you know what your colleagues are saying. Oh, he's coming back with a full plane again. Oh, thank you for that. And so um, the pilots did their best to land the plane in Berlin on the first attempt. The airlift functioned amazingly well in spring 1949, bringing in a record amount of tonnage on the 15th to 16th April. In a period of 24 hours, approximately 13,000 tons were delivered. More goods were flown into the city on that day than had arrived before the blockade by roll, water, and rail together. Furthermore, the Allies were able to land 1,396 planes within this 24-hour period. And this is an average of one plane every 62 seconds over a period of 24 hours. An incredible and outstanding record. This was a unique demonstration of the Allies' cap capability. These impressive numbers were broadcasted by the media worldwide and demonstrated the power of the logistic ability of the Anglo-American Air Fleet. The Continuing positive reporting on Alatonich and the growing reputation of the Western powers were certainly part of the reason for the lifting of the Soviet blockade on May 12, 1949. Despite the end of the blockade, for a couple of reasons, the airlift continued for another four months into late summer 1949. 
on the 30 of September 49, the last US plane of Operation Vittles landed in Berlin. So next week, Monday, we have the 70th anniversary of the last US airlift flight to Berlin. What remains are the impressive numbers. Uh, 2.1 metric tons. Um, by the way, that is another problem in the literature and the explaining airlift. Uh, you always have different um, figures. Uh, for example, metric tons. So uh, we have three partners involved. You have the Americans, you have the British, and you have the Germans. So the Germans are counting tons in metric tons. The British are counting tons in long tons, and the Americans are counting tons in short tons. So, hmm, okay, which ton are you talking about now? So the uh, Anglo-American air fleet uh, decided to count American short tons, uh, but that makes a difference to uh, the German metric tons. So uh, that's some one of the reasons why sometimes in literature differ different tonnage uh, turns up. So they, tr they transported that in about 270,000 270, flights to Berlin, same amount backwards, and 67% of the tonnage was flown in by the Americans, the remaining 24% by the British. But also 166,000 people were flown out of the city during the airlift. The tragic death that occurred during the 12th or during the 15-month airlift, must also be acknowledged. 39 British, 31 American, and at least eight Germans lost their life in accidents. Uh, their names are engraved on the base of the airlift memorial in Berlin district of Tempelhof. We've just seen a picture, and here we see a picture when this um, monument was uh, unveiled. Um, and uh, there is a ceremony every year to honor those who lost their lives during the airlift. The Berlin airlift obviously changed the relationship between the Western powers and West Berlin. Just a few years after World War II, the one-time enemies had mastered a severe political crisis by intensive cooperation. The population of Berlin now experienced the occupying powers as protecting powers. And uh, you know this photo from the poster downstairs? Uh, this is 11-year-old um, uh, Susanna Jokes uh, handing over a bunch of flowers uh, to a pilot. And uh, you might not saw it on the first glimpse, uh, she has no shoes. Um, well, that's, um, that's how it was. No, not uh, every, every girl, every boy on the Berlin streets in 48 um, had shoes. And at the Allard Museum, uh, 60 years after this picture was taken, we found both. We found her. She was living in Switzerland now. And we found him. He was um, obviously one of the members of the um, uh, lift uh, association. And we brought them together after 60 years, and that was a remarkable moment when they met for the first time 60 years after this picture was taken. For the world politics in this first episode of the Cold War, that was also a great, a great blueprint. Uh, a serious conflict was not solved by bombs or machine guns. This first crisis of the Cold War was solved by logistics and by flying lorries transport planes like the C-54 or the C-47 without firing a single shot. Looking back at the Operation Vittles, it is still fascinating how perfect the logistics for the airlift was. That also includes the maintenance of the planes. So I'm very happy that our special guest today, Ralph Dion, was not only flying inside the cockpit, but also knows a lot about maintenance the backbone of the operation. So Ralph and I will now talk about his involvement in the Berlin Airlift, and I thank you for your attention for the moment. Thank you. <laughs> so Ralph, if you please come up. <laughs> <laughs> so Ralph, we already heard that you are joining uh, the age of 19, and after two years... Yeah, just a young guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after two years, in 1948, uh, you 
were sent to Frankfurt. Um, yes. Tell me about your feeling. You know, you're a young man, 28, uh, 21 years, and oh, yeah. uh, the war was just over three years, and now you have to go to Germany. Right. Uh, just out of high school, almost, you know? Yeah. And uh, living here in this country, being brought up, it was so different. <coughs> when it got into Germany, Berlin, the buildings were bombed, and it seems like you, there weren't many men around, it, old ladies in dark clothing with a satchel, either with a bicycle. It, it was real poverty, and it was pitiful. And in Frankfurt, we had a, our, our outfit had a good barracks, what used to be SS barracks. We were well off. And in other airfields, other veterans were in tents and mud and so forth. I can't complain. But there was a gate around this barracks area, and women would come, the old women would come to the gate begging to help uh, with your laundry. We would give the laundry to the ladies, the people there, and they would take it home and bring it back faithfully. You, you, you depended on them and you could trust them. They were good people. And they get paid in cigarettes. That was the money of that time, cigarettes. And, um, you know, people would walk around, they'd stop, and they'd pick up the butt, and save it, and put it in their pocket. And, it's pitiful. That's tough for a young man to see such a change. Were you, by the way, were you smoking at the time? No, I very seldom smoked. Okay. <laughs> I don't get any ha bad habits. <laughs> so you had a, another special currency uh, while right. you were in Frankfurt. I, right. <laughs> I would go buy a couple of cartons of cigarettes and yeah. use them as currency. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I went to Paris with, on two packs, two cartons of cigarettes. Yeah, about that. yeah. yeah that's, that's right. all I had. And uh, I know another veteran. So the main that, problem is story. <laughs> main problem is that, that most of the veterans were smoking themselves. So uh, by the way, uh, Lucius D. Clay was a heavy smoker. Uh, you can see him smoking on nearly a any I'm picture. You can oh. find him. Hey, Rob. So that's you, Ralph. Yeah. <laughs> But if, if you are non-smoking at the time, you no. usually uh, have had a good life at Germany or you save. I know one veteran, he's saving all his cartoons. And at the end of his time, after two years, he bought a new car, just with the cigarettes he didn't smoke. <laughs> Maybe they work <laughs> yeah. today as well. So here you see, uh, it's a picture of you. Do, can you remember when that was taken? I believe that was taken at Westover Field. It was during the winter time. And that was prior to the airlift. Yep. I was a corporal at that time, like two stripes. And I got to be a sergeant. But, uh, and then when it was time to re-enlist, they said, well, we will put you in for a staff sergeant if you'll stay in. And I said, hmm, that's a promise is not good enough. If I had the stripes now, it would be different. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a GI Bill of Rights at that time, and I decided to go to college instead and get an education. I attended Boston University and took up uh, business administration. And I felt that if I wanted to go back in as an officer, I had the education, I would do so. Uh, I met my wife in my third year of college, and I got married. And I decided it's not good to bring your kids around the country and all over the world let them stay home and have a normal upbringing. And they had three boys, and they were wonderful. They turned out great. So that's just a little side talk, but uh, that's what happened. <laughs> OK. So Ralph, I mentioned uh, the maintenance uh, being the backbone of the operation. Absolutely. Uh, I, I know all the steps that an airplane had to do, but can you uh, briefly explain um, what the maintenance for, let's say, uh, C-54 was during the Berlin airlift? Well, <laughs> in each engine has spark plugs. They have to be replaced occasionally because they go bad and they skip. And uh, there were 144 spark plugs on the C-54. So it kept us busy. The heavy loads of the aircraft landing after landing just seared the tires. So we had to, we had to change tires all the time. And uh, 
maintenance, everything, you had to inspect the aircraft, open up the engine cowling, climb a ladder, you didn't have anything else, and at night with a flashlight, get in that engine, check to see if there's any leakage of fuel or oil of that type, which is a fire hazard, and also check the, uh, the wiring and the piping for security, and that's part of the inspection. So they have a 25-hour inspection, they have a 50-hour, they have a 100-hour. So the planes are continually have to be taken out of service and service as fast as possible and get them back into action. Um, and all these maintenance services were done at the base until up to 100 hour, and then I think they had to fly to Great Britain because there was a special the, base it, uh, form. There was a change team. in the procedure, but uh, the local 25 hours and so forth were done uh, right at a home base in the Rhine, Maine. There was another base near Munich, and yeah, that was for a, a larger inspection. And um, I got called in one day and said, you're going to be a crew chief. You're going to take an aircraft to Munich, and they will Oberhofen Puffen? Yeah, Oberhofen Puffen. Yes. OK. And you're going to have, o have the plane. Oberhofen Puffen, oh. like Americans. Yeah, <laughs> boy. Oberhofen Puffen. <laughs> Anyways, um, I did stay there, and I stayed up for 36 hours just to make sure the inspection went well. Well, after that was over, they told me I had to fill in the log books of all the maintenance that had been performed. So I was tired, but I had a photograph of all the paperwork. and It was a lot to do. Then go back and start all over again from Rhine, Maine. Um, there's a lot of stories, but work is good. And uh, when you're accomplishing something, you have a, a sense of accomplishment. And it is rewarding. Uh, the airlift itself is one of the highlights of my life because the American people were behind us, the Air Force and the British, and it was a great, like a great football game. <laughs> you got to win, you know? <laughs> and we kept up and we did. So it's great. And the pilots were relying on you that you did your maintenance uh, and, good and... And, and I you. had faith in the pilots, believe me. <laughs> yeah. A lot of our flying was in fog during the winter time. And um, all the aircraft had to operate on what they call instrument flight rules, not visual. They had to adhere to the, the uh, instrument flight rules, and they had a GCA approach they had to maintain all the time, keep these planes timed at certain altitudes, certain distances apart, all the same airspeed. That's why they standardized on the C-54s, uh, the earlier C-47s <coughs> and the commercial planes from Britain traveled at different uh, rates of speed, right. and they, they couldn't do it. They, so they had to organize everything. And after a while on the ground, uh, maintaining, um, like here on the photo, you can, we can see you oh, working yeah. on a propeller. Uh, yep. Uh, after a while, <laughs> um, you enter the cockpit yourself, and you joined uh, by the co-pilot. Uh, right. After that, after a session, about two months of uh, being the mechanic, I was... They needed more air crews, so they're pulling everybody. And uh, they said to me in the operation shark, you're going to be an aerial engineer. I said, fine, what do you do? <laughs> says, All you do is what the pilot tells you to do. <laughs> so you're the third hand for the pilot. Uh, the pilot does the flying, the co-pilot does the um, navigational work and the radio work. The flight engineer sits in the middle, just like this, pilot, co-pilot, and he is in front of the stand of controls. The pilot will be coming in for a landing. He'll say, lower the flaps 15 degrees. Yes, sir, 15 degrees. Then he'll say, lower the landing gear, lower the landing gear. He says, uh, open the cow flaps, open them up, and you keep your eyes on the oil pressure, the oil temperature, the fuel quantity, uh, anything that has to do with the operation of the engines. So it's a team, a three-man team. You work together, and it works excellent. And we did not have the same crew on each flight. It just happened that you got called for a flight, and you might have a different engine, a different pilot, co-pilot, all the time. So you had to work together. Teamwork did it. And that's what made the difference. 
And there's one unusual thing that you told me when we were talking about this evening. Uh, what would you estimate, how often did you fly to Berlin, roughly? I really don't know. <laughs> I would say about 30 times. Okay. Because I flew to England for maintenance, and I flew back to the United States for maintenance. So there's a lot of different flights. And uh, I'd say 30, 40. I have uh, 300 hours. And uh, they called me in and said, you got 300 hours? You're going back to Westover Field in Massachusetts? I said, ah, I was having the time of my life. <laughs> you know, you, how many people have sitting up in a cockpit of an airline or a large airplane and see what's going on? And when you're coming in for a landing, you see everything. And you know, on one flight, there's, there's a road that goes by the Temple Half Airport. Yeah, it sits down right, right the, the Autobahn. And I didn't give it much thought. One day we're coming back from Rhein, from uh, Tempelhof, and it's foggy. You see nothing out the window. So we're coming in for a landing, and the pilot's in contact with GCA, continue, continue. So I'm looking at the altimeter. Here we are, 500 feet. Yes, you see another 400 feet. Well, mm, 300 feet. 100 feet. And the car goes zoom under the wings. I said, <laughs> holy cow. And, Whoop, we hit the we hit the runway, and <laughs> she said, "Go around, go around." Pa says, "Negative, we're on the ground and rolling." <laughs> so <laughs> that's something. But even though you had been uh, up to thirty times or more uh, to oh, Berlin, yeah. you didn't have the chance to to uh, stay in Berlin for for a couple no. of hours or for a day. I never saw Berlin during the airlift. We flew into Berlin, and we got out of the plane, and we put the gust locks, the locks in the landing gear. We put the stand on the tail, and opened the, the doors were open, and the truck would come up and then unload. We had to stay there, yeah. and uh, General Tanner changed Six, that because yeah. yeah, the right. pilots and the crews used to go away for a coffee yeah. into the cafeteria. Yeah. He said, "No more. You stay with your planes. Yeah. Fifteen minutes, you're out," yeah. and it worked. And roughly 15 minutes was the time that a German unloading crew needed to unload a C-54 with a 10 tons of cargo. But on the other hand, uh, Tana, Tana sent those nice little uh, German Fräuleins with uh, donuts. Uh, yeah, uh, they, they had the car, coffee car, the truck, a little van. They had some beautiful girls here and, <laughs> and serve coffee. That's where we went. <laughs> we had to go back, duty calls. <laughs> you know, it's something to sit in line, 10 or 12 large aircraft ahead of you, all the engines, all vrooming, vrooming, and you get that thundering feeling. All it's, it's, it's uh, it, 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 I can't forget it. You know, I'll never forget it. And it, it's great. I'm but sorry to diverge. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yes, so hope if you would like to join us. And I think we are now open for any questions uh, that you would like to ask, uh, either dealing with uh, Hope's lecture with Mai or with uh, the things Ralph just told us. So uh, if there is a question, please go to the microphone and uh, let us know. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> so, so thanks very much for a, a terrific uh, uh, series of talks and your service. Um, this, the stories that I've heard in, in the past have always been that the Berlin Airlift landed in Tempelhof, and I'm surprised tonight to learn that it was landing in, uh, in Tegel and, and the there, other There were three, three air bases. So it started it, with two, uh, two airports, then it, Tegel was the third one. So why does Tempelhof have sort of, so sort of the prominence uh, over the other two? Because it's in town center. Um, to be honest, it is a myth. It's even a myth that most planes land at Tempelhof. That's not true. Because most planes land at Ghetto. So the fact is that also a lot of, also all the British planes land in Ghetto, and a lot of American planes land also in Ghetto. So the idea behind Tempelhof is that it was in town center. 
every uh, Berliner could see those planes coming into the city with cargo, and Tempelhof is, and, and Gatto is so far away. <laughs> even, even today, you would need by car more than half an hour. And at the time, there were no Berliners around to see what is happening in Gatto or what is happening in Tegel. So all three uh, airfields were, um, had a lot of work during the uh, airlift, but uh, Tempelhof was the most prominent one because it was actually in town center. So I, I have flown to Tempelhof uh, back in the day, and I was actually quite astonished to see that it, how downtown it was. So uh, thanks for that uh, explanation. Um, we all have the benefit of hindsight. We can see that the ELF was successful. At the time, when, when did it become apparent that this, was act this crazy idea was actually going to work? And um, did, uh, was there any time where, we, where Truman or Clay thought that uh, it wasn't going to work and we'd have to uh, abandon the idea? I think the answer is twofold. From my perspective, I would say uh, after Tana arrived and introduced all those uh, new things, uh, I mentioned a few, that's from my point of view the point uh, where they knew it will work. Maybe from a pilot's point or from a guy uh, involved in it, that uh, was maybe a diff different question well, for you. We didn't get involved in the politics. We were flying, and that was the job, you know? But do you have, working on the ground, working uh, on the base, did you have the feeling it's not going to work? Well, we did never had the feeling that it wasn't going to work. It, it, it just, you do your job, you do your job, and, uh, you know. And you made it work. There's no sign of failure. <laughs> If, if the weather was bad, you went. If it was good, you went. And, uh, right, so but, but you, you felt it was sustainable. You could go on like that, and there wasn't a point where, you know, we could only do another three months, and uh, yeah. we'd be exhausted. Uh, it went on for six months, and then three months after, they kept flying stuff in in case the Russians changed mm. their mind. Now, uh, at one point, was, that hasn't been brought up, and we didn't know about it, uh, those who were flying. Uh, the President Truman sent 90 B-29s to England, and he let the Russians know about it. Now, these B-29s were atom bomb capable, and, but they did not have atom bombs in them. The Russians didn't know that. But uh, they made it known that Moscow was going to get hit if they interfered. And that, that stayed their hand, and uh, it's great. Because there were times when the Russian pilots were buzzing the aircraft. Early, early in, yes, they were. Did you and ever was a crash. experience that? No, not from my flights. But the British soldiers, they had more problems. So, as I say, I was comfortable in Frankfurt, but in the British bases, they were discomfort, you know. And the food was lousy. <laughs> and we had a mess hall, and the German people, they had women serving the food. And they also had the women taking care of the barracks, the area. So from Rhine, Maine, we had it good. And we, we, as a matter of fact, they had like uh, school buses. A military buses would take us from Frankfurt to 10 miles to the airport. Mm -hmm. And we'd do our duty, and after 12 hours, come back. So we were shuttled back and forth from the Rhine, Maine to Frankfurt. Um, and we used to joke with the German drivers all the time. You know, one of the, one of the fellows says to the driver, hey, driver, he says, speed up. There's a dog peeing on the back wheel. <laughs> <laughs> we, we ribbed them. We had a good time. <laughs> you have to have a sense of humor to, to get you through. Thank you for the presentation. And thank you for sharing your experiences. I have a question. Um, how was this tremendous feat of logistics received by Soviet intelligence? Well, they didn't expect it, that's, that's for sure. And uh, I think they were hoping that the winter would stop uh, the Berlin airlift. I mentioned, or Ralph also mentioned, uh, fog. Fog was the major problem. Especially in November, uh, the, the, the number of flights is going down because we had a couple of days, uh, actually weeks, 
where the weather was uh, very bad. Right. But that's it. Uh, it was not as cold. Uh, we had no strong winter, 48, 49, and um, the operation was that running smooth. That helped a lot. And uh, that's why they didn't circle the airplanes around anymore. If you missed your landing, you went back. And that kept things going like a big chain. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't yeah. think Russians, uh, Russian intelligence, uh, what could they do? Well, they, 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 they noticed how many planes would land. It's in the newspaper every day. That e they don't have to count it. It's in the newspaper next day how many oh, yeah. planes landed. So, but they can't do anything about it, could they? Absolutely, and it, it, it fueled this image of the West is helping, um, you know, while the Soviets have been taking things out of yep. their zones, the Americans and British are bringing things mm -hmm. into their zones. So in addition to saving the island of two and a half million West Berliners, it was a massive propaganda coup and, you know, a real coup for the West showing, you know, we were helping people, uh, people who had just been our enemies. enemies. I mean, really extraordinary. That's America. Which gets me to my question to you. You've mentioned a few times your interactions with Germans. Yes. Um, can you tell us more about what that was like to be a young American, World War II has just ended, and there you are, um, and you're meeting Germans. What was that like? Well, there was a bit of bad feeling towards the Germans, of course, because of World War II and so many Americans had gotten killed. But can you imagine the pilot who had been bombing the Germans, who had been shot at and uh, flack and go through all that? They are the ones that had a problem in converting their attitude, and they did. I have a friend, Chuck Childs, who flew 37 missions and he had to fly to help the Berliners. And he's a great man, and uh, he, he did his duty. Um, is there anything else you <laughs> on that? Hi, thanks so much. This has been wonderful. Um, so as we are sort of experiencing um, <laughs> like a, a reboot of the Cold War and a lot of these same issues or a lot of people, uh, you know, just our relationship with Russia is becoming increasingly stickier. Um, this is such an encouraging story, but I don't think a lot of young Americans know it. I don't know if young Germans know more about it. Um, what, what should America remember about this? What shouldn't we forget, um, especially as these issues are sort of coming about again? Absolutely. You know, they say history repeats itself. And if we're not careful, we're going to repeat the bad parts of history. America was great when doing these things, and they should maintain that friendship and relationship with Germany hand in hand. Hope, what, what do you think about the last question? Um, I, I think it's a wonderful question, and I agree yes. that um, um, U.S.-German relations r remain a cornerstone of the whole post- the Peace. Th yeah, the peace in the yeah. post-World War II era, and um, Germany is now the main power in Europe, and it is, it is absolutely essential that the U.S., from my perspective, that the U.S. and Germany have uh, good relations in, in every way. Um, so, you know, looking back at this period of time when we helped them, and again with German unification, the German unification in 1990, these same four powers, the US, Soviet Union, Great Britain, and France, in 1990, after more than 40 years of division, those four powers had to agree to allow Germany to be reunited. And because of World War II, the Soviets, the British, and the French were all rather skeptical about letting Germany be re reunited. It was only the um, United States with President George H.W. Bush that was firmly trusting that West Germany had really become a democracy and was going to expand to East Germany and that that was okay. We could trust this Germany. And I think that is you know, overwhelmingly proven to be the case in the 29 years since Germany united and 
I think Germans should be really proud of what they've achieved. Um, and Americans and Germans, um, I think we always have to remember um, that we have been very strong allies and should remain so now and in the future. Absolutely. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, two questions. Number one, um, what was the French involvement, or were they not involved at all? And number two, um, question about women and whether there were any female pilots involved um, in terms of the airlift, or were they, you mentioned earlier, you needed bodies. So I was just curious whether the women also participated in the um, airlift. Thank you. The, the French contributed not so much by flying. They had one JU-52 aircraft to contribute, and somebody backed up into the tail, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the end of that. But they had a zone, and they often, they allowed an airport to be on their Teagle on their land, and that was a key uh, factor in getting supplies in. And uh, they did a little bit more. There was a Russian radio tower close to the approach to that airport was being built. So one night, one of the officers, French officers, went down there, and the tower disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Next day, the commanding officer said, what happened to the tower? Dynamite, sir. <laughs> they blew it up. So they, they helped as best they could. Now, don't, uh, don't forget. All that coal was so important to go to Berlin. That coal had to come from French mines. It had to be mined. It had to be put on trains and transported to Western uh, Germany. Then it had to be put on trucks and brought to the plains. So they contributed, and food had to be available for the people. And it came from uh, Holland and Netherlands and, and France. So they all contributed, and uh, not in aircraft. <laughs> The main okay. contrib contribution was indeed uh, building uh, the badly needed uh, third uh, airport in the French sector, Tegel. Yeah. And uh, concerning women, uh, Tegel was built uh, by, as I said, approximately 19,000 workers. Roughly 40% of them were women. So they were doing the hard work with a shovel. And uh, that's one point. And the other, uh, the French had indeed uh, four aircraft, but they were just, as he said, uh, old Junkers uh, with, a, with a load of uh, three tons. And actually, in October, the uh, Anglo-American uh, Tana actually said to the French, please do us a favor and leave those four planes <laughs> on the ground. <laughs> because they wouldn't fit. You know, I showed you the stream of those uh, airplanes, and they were too slow. <laughs> they wouldn't fit in there, so they kept the four on the ground, and they were w working on the on the Tegel airport. The other important thing to say about France and all of this is that France was um, initially closer to the Soviet attitude toward the Germans, namely revenge, mm -hmm. as opposed to help rebuild yep. because of the occupation of France. So it was really the Soviet blockade of Berlin that finally three years after the end of the war, um, persuaded the French that they should see the Soviets as, greater, as a greater threat than the Germans. So um, that was part of it. There was you know, the political diplomatic feeling the French weren't initially fully behind this, but the Soviet blockade changed that. Good question. I'd like to thank this evening's panelists. I've really enjoyed your presentation, and I was wondering if um, one of you may speak to how these goods were distributed to um, Germans in Berlin after they left the airport. There must have been an enormous logistical undertaking. Who administered that and saw that the goods got to the people in need? That's right, that was the Berlin Senate. Uh, after the freight landed, uh, no longer the Allies were in charge of it for all the stuff that went to the Berlin population, but the Berlin Senate uh, had to make sure that the coal went to the Berlin industry or to the people, as I said, with a 12 kilogram on their ration card. 
uh, that um, the stuff went to the bakery, so the bread the, the, uh, the can be done. Flour. Yeah, so that was um, that was a task for the Berlin uh, Magistrat, yeah. Yeah, not yeah. the Allies. Uh, the people, the, each family was entitled to one hod of coal per week. So you had to be very careful. And it was cold, <laughs> very cold out. Um, so, of course, this is before the um, Berlin Wall was built. And so there was, I guess, some f free movement between what's, what was East Berlin and West Berlin. And so, um, and I guess the radio and the newspapers and so forth were more freely distributed at that time than after the Berlin Wall. So my question is, um, what did the inhabitants of the DDR know about this, think about this? How did it affect them? Or, uh, well, first of all, it's important to keep in mind um, um, for most of the airlift, there, the two German states didn't exist yet. It was still occupied Germany. It was only in May of 49 that West Germany was created, and in October of 49, East Germany was created, the misnamed German Democratic Republic. Um, so um, they, you know, they weren't states. Um, they, everyone was fully aware of what was going on. I mean, for one thing, especially with Tempelhof, you know, hearing the planes, um, sometimes seeing the planes, um, uh, reading about it, reading on the radio, um, U the US radio in the American sector, RIAS, um, was very influential, um, announcing what was going on, telling the story of this. So all the Berliners could listen on the radio. Um, it, it had been a United City. It's you know it mostly still was a United City. So people were moving around. You had mm -hmm. families in in different Books. parts of it. That didn't change until the Berlin Wall was built in 1961. A completely different Berlin crisis um, years later. Now certainly. The newspapers that were um, published in the communist zone of Berlin and, and Germany were, you know, somehow, I don't know what story they would have been telling um, to, to spin this in some sort of negative way. That would have been pretty hard to do. Um, but um, they um, certainly wouldn't have been reporting on it a lot, the way it would have dominated the, the press in the Western zones. Well, one aspect, a uh, very good question, one aspect is that uh, in the Soviet zone, they offered uh, an East German ration card for the West Germans. So if the West German would go to East Germany, register there, they would be supplied with a better ration card. But only less than 5% did that. So because of Ernst Reuter, uh, he was very important for the morale of the Berliners. And they said, well, we stay firm. We don't register in the East to get an egg more or to get uh, 100 uh, grams of uh, butter more. No, we stay in West, uh, West uh, Berlin and uh, put our faith together with the Allies. So that was one response from the East that they were offering better ration cards in the East if the West Germans are going to the East and register in the East. But uh, as I said, only a very limited percentage did that. Could I interject something here? We hear about the candy bomber. Not just a candy bomber. The results of his dropping candy to the children had a very important effect there in Berlin. The parents are under pressure and uh, trying to decide whether to go with the Russians or the Americans, but the children came home with candy. The kids didn't know what candy was. They didn't know what chewing gum was even. <laughs> and they'd come home and bring this candy and show it to the parents. The parents would say, these Americans and British, they love children. They can't be that bad. And it helped turn their attitude for the candy bombing. It, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, people, I mean, Berliners remember that. And, and the airlift, the, 
you know, to this day. Um, it, it just was a foundational moment in establishing a close relationship of uh, Berlin with the West. And it started with one young lieutenant starting dropping a few parachutes down to the kids. And he got called in to, by his commanding officer the next day, what you doing? He said, you're dropping candy. You're supposed to be flying the airplane. <laughs> he got the devil. However, the newspaper got a hold of it. And when the general found out, the, but not a general, but they found out about the results and what it was doing, he was commended. And then he was, they started the Little Vittle program, which was the dropping of candy. And other pilots and other planes followed suit. And uh, even in back in Westover Field, the, uh, the local towns, the kids were making parachutes and the parents and the uh, confectionery industry, they devoted, they sent thousands and thousands of pounds of candy and, and they had a warehouse full. <laughs> they didn't know what to do with it <laughs> back in Germany. So anyways, it was important. It's a good example of a relationship, <laughs> starting relationship. Um, in the United States, they asked for candy and sweets for the Berlin Airlift. And tons and tons of sweets and candy was collected here, shipped over uh, yeah. to Germany and dropped there. And in the Allied Museum, uh, we have actually a parachute um, done by an American family. Uh, they put on the address. And the idea was that the German boy or German girl that is able to get this parachute will write to the family, so create a relationship. So that was a good idea. Another little thing about oh, the yes. candy bomber. <laughs> <laughs> we can see why the airplane was successful. If, he ha if you have the energy oh, now, God. imagine what he was doing with the planes. Bill Halverson, my buddy, he, um, he got a flight into Tempelhof as a passenger because he wanted to speak to the kids who were gathering near the fences watching the airplanes. And he asked one of the little boy, the girl, whatever, did you get a candy bar? And the little girl says, no, I never know what airplane you got and what airplane you are, you know? So Halvinson says, well, I'll tell you what, when I come, I'll wiggle my wings and that you'll know it's me. And he was thereafter known as Uncle Wiggly Wings to the kids. <laughs> And another child complained. <laughs> he asked her if she got any candy. No, she said, well, she complained that the plane was boiling her chickens who wouldn't lay eggs. <laughs> yeah. That's Mercedes. That's Mercedes. They become Mercedes. Good friends. Yeah. Yeah. They That's become right. good friends. That's the little girl we saw. No, not the, no, not the no. other one. No, another one. But it's a yeah. little girl, and actually she wrote him a letter actually yeah. complaining that the chickens are laying no eggs because of the planes, and then he uh, heavens and sent them a parcel. And many, many years later, when she was adult and with her husband, uh, they met again, and for a lifetime, up until now, yeah. uh, they are stayed very close friends. It lives on forever. I went to Berlin on May 12th this year at the invitation of the mayor and I brought my son from California with me. I wanted him to see and experience the love and the respect and the memory of these people in Berlin. They say Berlin never forgets, and they still celebrate every year. And we were invited in, and uh, we had about uh, 20 from the States that attended, and they had concerts for us. And uh, they had, oh my God, it, Special, special uh, at the dinner. You know, yeah. 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 Anyways, they treated us royally. Well, because of what you did. Because of yeah. what I did. Mm -hmm. Yes, I went to Dicky Wharton. You heard about that restaurant in Berlin? Very famous, Dicky Wharton. Uh, we were about twenty in that restaurant, and uh, it's very quaint and very old and typically Berlin. So. We all ate together and had a great time. And when it got time to go, we had a two vans to, was supposed to come outside and pick us up. So the vans did arrive. And I went outside, down five stairs to the sidewalk, and checked things out. 
this waitress comes flying down the stairs. And another waiter in back of her, she comes to me and she says, you're an airlift man? I said, yes. She says, oh, so she hugs me. She said, my grandmother, she told me when I was a little girl that some, in the past, the American men come down from the air and they brought food to us and saved us. And she always wanted to meet a veteran. And she was so thrilled. She sent the, the other waiter up. She asked me, did you pay for your bill yet? I said, no, I just come down to check on the, the, the bus, you know, the, whatever. And uh, so the waiter goes back, gets the bill, brings it down. She takes it and looks at it. I pay. Mm -hmm. Now, that is respect. And that is, tells you a lot how the b common Berliners feel. Mm -hmm. And it's due to everybody, Americans here. It's America. That's the heart. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful. <laughs> 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 <laughs>